we go. This is week two of the Atomic Habits. Um, kind of recapping from last week, one of the things was to do your own habit scorecard. And like I was mentioning earlier, um, we're trying to get away from a habit being good or bad because that places a value on it, which can place a, a value on us because we engage in those habits or we do not engage in those habits. But a plus or a minus of getting you closer or further away um, from your habits. I did kind of a sketch as best as I do in taking notes of writing some of those things down. There's some good stuff in the book too. Like straight at what you're, what you're saying is um, in chapter four, he says, um, if you're still having trouble determining on how to write a particular habit, here's a question I'd like to use. Does this behavior help me become the type of person I wish to be? Does this habit cast a vote for or against my desired identity? And I thought that like it really helped me separate out some stuff that I was trying to figure out. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the one of the comments he also made in here um, is you're getting into um, when you have you have your habit scorecard that also helps identify the cues and breaking down. Okay, what is the habit? What do I do? What is the cue that engage that triggers me to engage in that habit? And, and this is tricky because you, as he says in here, you don't need to be aware of the cue for a habit to begin. So even as we start identifying the habits, then we can break that down and identify what the cue is. You know, walking into your kitchen, walking into the bedroom or whatever else to do something and recognizing, okay, well, I always brush my teeth here. Um, an example he uses is um, very relevant to COVID right now where we work at the kitchen table, we eat at the kitchen table. Well, now we eat and work at the kitchen table. How do we separate those two so that when I sit down to eat, I don't start working again? Or for me, the opposite, like I do a lot of my studying on the couch. I eat on the couch and we relax on the couch. So relaxing and eating and studying and eating have gotten really linked together. And I'm working on like eating in one spot, studying another and working someplace else. So that one isn't cueing the other without me even being aware of it. Yeah, we used to have the, the, the habit of dinner was always at the dining area table. Dinner has kind of migrated to the kitchen or to the, to the, to the couch. And we, you know, then you end up sitting there and it's, I've realized we're both immediately, as soon as we get done, we've turned the TV on, we pull out our phones or iPad or whatever and start interacting on those devices and not interacting with each other. Right. And then it's just like so easy for that to just slide into dinner, slides into TV time, and then it's bedtime and all of the stuff that I would normally do between eating and sitting down never gets done. Like, you know, clean up the kitchen all the way or whatever thing I had left. It doesn't get done because there's nothing there to cue me to do it. Absolutely. And that has been very obvious in our house in probably the last two weeks or so that, yeah, I pick up the dishes, I take them back into the kitchen and I'm lazy. I didn't clean everything up and put it in the dishwasher. And Carol may not even go back in the kitchen for the evening because we're on the other side of the house now. So it sits there until the morning. And we've never done that before. And so getting back to eating at the dining room table. So then we are cute because then you have to walk past all the kitchen stuff. And there's a little OCD there that I can't allow that because I've seen it now and we have to ignore it. So build your habit scorecard. And then from the habits, that's where we can identify those cues. Um, you know, it's one of the things that he mentions in here in the, in the summary is once once our habits become automatic, we stop paying attention to what we're doing. So that automatic habit of always eating on the sofa and watching TV becomes ingrained. 
in that chapter also i really liked um where you talked about calling out your 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 negative habits like if you want to cut back on your junk food habit but you notice yourself grabbing another cookie say out loud i'm about to eat this cookie but i don't need it eating it will cause me to gain weight and hurt my health like doing that i've i've ta- i've picked that practice up of when i'm doing something that i know that i'm isn't towards the person I want to be like saying it out loud and at least noting it and bring it to my conscious brain is making me consider more what whether what I'm getting ready to do is something I actually want to do and not just have it that's a that's a good point I forgot I had that in my notes here of pointing and calling strategy and, and Mary the the book talked about some of the um subway procedures where they actually have to say something and then do it. Say something and do it. And it's, that puts your full focus there. Um, like for us, when we go out somewhere, um, and part of this again is my OCD, um, I have to hear the car beep when I've locked the car doors. If you've not made it beep, I don't care how locked the doors are. The doors are not locked until they beep, until the car beeps. So if we ever get a car that doesn't do that, I can't buy it. And, and it doesn't matter if it, I'm doing it or when we get out of Carol's driving, I cannot function until I hear the car beep. And it's the same way when we travel, we have to actually hold our tickets up or hold the, your phone up with it before we leave the house. When we get to the airport, we still have them. When we get to the check-in line, we still have them and we're physically pulling them up and showing them to each other. Um, I never realized that was point and calling, but yes, it is. Phone, wallet, keys, phone, wallet, keys. I sing that to myself as I'm leaving anywhere. Phone, wallet, keys. And you touch them. Yes, just to make sure. Mary, do you do anything like that? Uh, yes. I know I do because I, 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 I'm very habit forming because of my ADD um, at work, especially I have to do it sequentially. If I don't, then I'm all out of whack, but I don't know how to describe all the sequence because it varies per situation, but I do, I do do that. I do verbalize or, and sequentially do things. I do have a little bit of OCD, but not as bad as you. <laughs> do you do the thing, Mary, as a nurse, where you check with each other like 10, 10 megs or whatever? You say it to the, the person that you're with? Um, we used to do it a lot, especially for high, con- you know, high error meds like insulin and stuff. Yeah. Now they don't require it, but we still, I think the old nurses, old school nurses, like I am, we still do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm giving two units for a blood sugar of 80, 185 or whatever, you know? So you're saying it to someone else to verify that you're not in the wrong or you're giving the wrong dose to the wrong person for the wrong reason or whatever. Definitely. Nurses are very good about doing that checking each other or having someone check your work just because there are such higher situations right yes thank you yeah so you and that it helps to as you as we talk through some of these things to also say out loud what we are recognizing and that which is part of the benefit of everything we're talking about here is saying it and confirming it and so okay now you have a starting point because you've identified a couple of things and you've identified some examples to help give you cues to look for more things um and in in chapter five it kind of it talks about implementation intentions and and part of that is an implementation is in the format of when situation x arises i will perform response y when X happens, I will do this. Or if this, then this. If I'm in the studio, I will attempt a handstand and attempt 
two pull-ups. Okay, so every time I walk into the studio, whether you get to see it or not, here's an attempted handstand and two pull-ups. If I'm in and out all day long, that's gonna build and that's gonna add up. Yeah. Um, I think one of the really powerful comments he made in here was, many people think that they lack motivation when what they really lack is clarity. And the value in that and to, and is, if you can't put something in a, you know, when X arises, I will perform a response Y, you don't have really have enough detail on how to do something. Well, I'm going to eat better. When I go into the kitchen, I'm not gonna eat junk food. Okay, well, there's what's junk food, what's not junk food, what are you gonna eat instead? What are you gonna do? When I go into the kitchen and it's not X times to eat of X, Y, or Z, I will not eat. Okay, now you're having to pass through the kitchen and recognize that it's not time. You might be a little hungry or something, but it might be a the habitual thing of every time you swing by the nurse's station, um, or for me and in, in some of my old jobs, there's that sky hook of the hand that would just swing on by and get a handful of M&Ms or jelly beans or whatever happened to be in a coworker's jar. Um, yeah, and the more stressful the night, the easier it is to grab and not think. And this thing has been really powerful in my life to not just say, I want to exercise more. I'm going to exercise more. Well, I know I should exercise more, but if I say I'm going to do my baseline minimum of planks and squats every morning at 8.30. Like I, I say when I'm gonna do it, it's much, it happens. It's more likely to happen when I actually say, when I, like I make a plan for it, I pull it, put it on my calendar and then it actually happens. And they, they also talk about habit stacking, which is kind of the corollary to what we were talking about of when something happens, I will do this. That's kind of a cause and effect. A habit stacking is after a current habit, I will execute a new habit. After my clients leave the studio, I will wipe everything down. Well, I, I you know, I've always, I've generally done that anyway, but I will wipe everything down and put it away. That way nothing ends up getting messed up you know, it could be when you're working with somebody else after you've done X, Y, or Z, you will do this. After you get home, you will do this or whatever. I love that idea of the idea, like the cue, craving, response, reward, and then the reward being the, the cue for my next habit. I love, I love that. Um, like when I have that satisfaction at the end of the meal, I just say, my cue is now, oh, I need to take this all back to the kitchen and get it in the dishwasher. I've been really changing the way that I think about that because of this. And some examples in the book here, uh, Mary, are like, after I, and so we're talking about habit stacking and you can actually stack habit, habit stack multiple times. So after I finish eating dinner, I will put my plate directly into the dishwasher. That's after I've rinsed it. I will put my, after I put my dishes away, I will immediately wipe down the counter. After I wipe down the counter, I will set out my coffee mug for tomorrow morning. So that could be after I finish eating dinner, I will load the dishwasher. After I load the dishwasher, I will wipe the counter down. After I wipe the counter down, I will set the coffee maker for tomorrow morning. I, I, I have some habits I need to uh, create because <laughs> I fly by the seat of my pants a lot. So the, the first law of um, the uh, first law of behavior changes is to make it obvious. So that, and the better we can do that, the more intentional we can be, the more specific we can be, eliminating that vagueness and using accuse of time and location, using an existing habit, 
um, using the habit stacking formula or the implementation intention formula. All of that creates a structure that you can, that you can repeat successfully. So kind of as we've talked through this, if we look at um, activity zones, where are areas um, that, and, and this could be home or work or whatever, examples of activity zones that you can, that you either use now or you could use as a result of this chapter. Where are your potential or current activity zones? Which, which chapter do you mean? So this is it, like the end of um, um, chapter five. Is this chapter five technically? Um, is it yep. the context? Talking about context. Oh boy. And it actually, we jump into it a little bit more in chapter six as well, but um, putting it, everything in context there. So if we look at chapter six is how to design you know, um, motivation is overrated. Environment often matters more. So. Absolutely the truth. The idea that make it obvious if you wanna create a habit or make it invisible if you want to um, break a habit um putting putting snacks on the other side of the refrigerator where when i walk into the kitchen my eyes don't immediately fall on the good stuff um has completely changed the way that i approach snacking like i i just it doesn't come into my sight it's invisible um it definitely the context of that has changed the way that i snack and that's i mean and that's um really kind of the key of chapter six and, and kind of into chapter seven is the context is the cue. Um, trying to create an environment where the environment itself is the trigger. Um, and the book also talks about avoiding mixing the context of one habit with another. Right. So if I'm trying to create a good habit in the kitchen, I also need to make sure I'm trying, I'm not trying to break a bad habit the same time in the kitchen. So when you start mixing context, you start mixing habits. Um, there was um, a couple of books out, Slim by Design was, the, was probably his biggest one. Um, um, Brian Wansink was his name. And this is what he did was this, basically this whole chapter of looking at restaurants how can restaurants redesign themselves to be more profitable how can grocery stores redesign themselves to be more profitable how can food manufacturers and that was his business was how do i redesign the box so that you're going to buy more boxes and then he turned that around to say okay the people that aren't buying my boxes or aren't eating as much in this buffet restaurant, what are they doing differently than everyone else? And what he found was all the same kinds of things that they're talking about here of redesigning your kitchen. You wanna eat your fruit, make it visible. Don't wanna eat the cookies? They're in the cabinet in the other room. And one of the, the, I actually, I put a sticky on next to this sentence because I felt like out of everything that I read, this was the most important sentence. Um, but when you step outside of your normal environment, you leave your behavioral biases behind. And this is the sentence. You aren't battling old environmental cues, which allow new habits to form without interruption. So when I'm trying to create a new habit, like my, the, Eric, you know, we just put that, that room in back there. That room is absolutely a cue for me to exercise. I go out there, my weights are out there. All my stuff is out there. I can't walk past that, that room to let the dog outside without thinking, oh, I could exercise right now. It is absolutely a cue for me to do that. And because I'm not battling the old environment, the new cue totally works in that new spot. And that's a really good point is when we get into the 
old established environments where we have those bad habits, it's tougher to break those habits. But if we can change something around, change that environment in some way, that those subtle or those un almost unconscious cues are disrupted. Um, every habit is initiated by a cue. We are more likely to notice cues that stand out. So change that environment in some way. Um, so would you classify a habit as an addiction too, or would that be a separate cue? Because like, I know I have a food addiction. So to tell me more about that. Well, I will compulsively go to the same thing over again. Once I have it, it's like I crave it like sugar. And I just, it's, it's like a cycle that once the sugar drops in my system, it was like, oh, I need more. I need more, just like an addiction. And so how, how, how would you think to apply something like that? Just take it completely out of my system? Like, like what I've described my sister doing? That's, it's a difficult thing to approach that way and going, trying to go cold turkey. I've is, tried, it doesn't yeah. work, but weaning doesn't work either. What if you thought about it differently? Like what if it wasn't an addiction? What if sugar tastes good and you like it and that's just it? But I can't stop once I start. Is, is that really I, I can't limit that. I'll only take one cookie or I, you know, I, I don't know how to set that boundary. Um, if the house caught on fire and you needed to leave the cookies behind, could you have just one cookie? Oh, well, yeah. So in the right context, you could eat one cookie. Yeah. Yes. So what if it wasn't an addiction? What if you just thought it was? So then your mind says, oh, okay, uh, it's just, it's an addiction. So I'm not even going to try to, to not think that way. But if you chose to think something different, like I can eat three cookies. If you introduced a different idea other than, oh, it's, I, I'm addicted. Yeah. Maybe it would be different. Okay. The wheels are turning. Yeah. So, and that kind of goes back to the first chapter is your identity. Yes. And if you, if you have established your identity as I am a food addict or I am a, a drug addict or I am whatever else or, um, you know, X, Y, or Z, and that's part of your identity, then you don't question it. You know, we can look at, um, I'm just a dumb jock. Well, that's made two identities to me. I'm a jock and I'm dumb. Well, I'm a little older, so I'm not as jockey as I used to be. And I'm going to school, I've been going to school, so I'm not quite as dumb as I used to be, in theory. I passed the tests. So I have to reframe what my identity is. I'm a professional and I'm, maybe it's, I'm a middle-aged jock now and, and after a couple of identity changes, middle-aged jock might be to I'm an active individual. Um, you guys, I'm sorry, I have to bail. Um, oh. Mary, it was good to meet you. Yes, and, um, thank you for your insight. I look forward to talking to you again. Bye. All right. Bye, see you later. Bye. Thanks, Eric. See you. Thanks, Mary. Bye. So we'll kind of jump down. So two, two takeaways then for you. Um, or actually, okay, there's more than that. Sorry, I lied. Um, instead of dis and, and this is some of that research that I referenced, um, disciplined people are better at structuring their lives in a way that does not require heroic willpower and self-control. In other words, they spend less time in tempting situations. Um, people with, and, and I'm reading from the book here, the people with the best self-control are typically the ones who need to use it the least. It's easier to practice self-restraint when you don't have to use it very often. So yes, perfect perseverance, grit, and willpower are essential to success. But the way to improve these qualities is not by wishing you were a more disciplined person, but by creating a more disciplined environment. 
and I know from some of my performance psychology studies, willpower is, and they've kind of argued back and forth, is willpower sustainable or is it, is it, is it an infinite or finite resource? And they've kind of gone back and forth, but in a lot of cases it generally says, willpower is a finite resource. If you've had to you know, white knuckle it for so long, then you're never gonna, you know, at some point of white knuckling it, you're gonna run out of willpower. Yeah. So how do we reframe that so that we don't have to use the willpower? And to kind of wrap up the beginning of this, the first law of behavior change, we're gonna look at it in two ways. So the first law of, of behavior change is to make it obvious. The inverse of that is to make it invisible. How do we make the habits that get us? Hi, whoever. Hi, roommate. It's my roommate, yeah. Yes. And she brought ice cream. <laughs> oh dear. This is my this is my my um, trainer. We're talking about my food addiction. <laughs> So busted. So uh, hey, I didn't, but I didn't buy it. <laughs> okay. But it boils down, you know. So how can you make the the habits or the cues that get you closer to your goals? How do we make them more obvious? And then the habits or or cues that get you further away from your goals. How do we make them invisible? So if you no longer see the trigger to go do something, you don't engage in it. But if you see constantly the trigger to do the thing that helps you, that makes it easier to take that step. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Now the, um, you know, and it, and it kind of summarizes that people with high self-control tend to spend less time in tempting situations. It's easier to avoid temptation than resist it. Um, obviously for me, if I want to go from the studio to, um, our bedroom in the house, I have to go through the kitchen. I have to pass by. And that's one of those things where it's e really easy to have that sky hook as the hand comes by. So I better make sure that, you know, the, the cookies out on the counter are gone, not by eating them, but by either hiding them or putting them under Carol's control. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Yes. So... Um, the first, and that's the first seven chapters of this. It's about a hundred pages, but yeah. it's a pretty quick read. Yeah, I, I was I was going to jump on it tonight um, before bed, <coughs> get at least a couple chapters read. And I went ahead and I bought the the workbook and journal for it. Well, I got the cheater guide. Remember? Well, yeah, it's on your Kindle <laughs> since 2019. No, that was the, that's the book. I had the book ah. and I bought the, the summary on accident, not realizing I had already bought the book. So you've got both of them now. Yeah. Um, I might end up using the journal. I got it to see how, what kind of notes and stuff in it. It's, uh, it's mostly blank pages. So even just a, a notebook or something would be helpful to write stuff down. Or if you're one that can scribble in the in the margins of your pages and keep track of it. Mm, no, Whatever works it. best for you, you know, because <laughs> I'll, I'll lose the journal. But if I put my notes and everything and scribble it and shove it back into the, the book, I'll remember that. I'll find that in two years. All right. So check that out. Um, next week, we'll be going on the second, the next section, which is the, um, the second um, fundamental law. Yeah, I, I'm I'm going on my my stretch off, so I'll have more more oh. time to read. Yeah, so I'm going to hit stop. Yeah, recording.